I think the greatest benefit that I've seen in terms of anxiety when it comes to meditation is that it's helped me learn how to tolerate and sit with discomfort instead of numbing out or running away from it. So then in that way, I can sort of show up and see, oh, I'm having a feeling of anxiety right now and find that separation from it. I am not just an anxious person. I am not my anxiety day. Anxiety is a feeling that I experience. And could I meet that where it is and get curious about it? I'm Philippa. In this podcast, me and my generous guests delve deep into the world of menopause. Buckle up and get ready to embark on a journey of empowerment and self-discovery as we embrace the change. Welcome to Moving Through Menopause. With me today, I have Heather Lilico. Heather is an anxiety warrior. I love that about you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. A yeah. self-proclaimed title. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I, I, those are the best, honestly. <laughs> So Heather and I are going to be sharing our top tips to help you deal with anxiety and overthinking. But before we get started, I really want to shout out and invite you to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts. And we really want to master this menopause transition. So I appreciate your likes and shares. And so we're going to dive into our topic today. Heather, thank you so much for joining me all the way from Canada. This is true. I dug myself out of the snow to be on this call today. (laughs) Thanks for having me, Philippa. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, and so we're going to be talking all about anxiety, managing anxiety, but uh, really with your three pillar approach. And that's a, a natural approach to managing anxiety, which, you know, I totally concur with anything natural and holistic in its approach, I think it's really important that we have these options because, you know, although estrogen is is often at the root of this problem, the menopause transition, when our estrogen levels are taking a nosedive, but, but, you know, that's not always the case. So having tools in your toolbox to help you, that's really what I'm interested to explore and share with people. So tell me a little bit about how you got into this work, if you would, Heather. Sure, absolutely. So in order to understand sort of how I got into this work, we need to backpedal a little bit. So growing up, I was always kind of a nervous kid. My mom used to say that I had a capital W for worry on my forehead and I was sensitive, like any type of criticism or feedback, and I would be in tears. I was a perfectionist. I had to get top marks and I felt like I couldn't ever relax. I always had to be doing and achieving. And I was an overthinker. I would overthink about, you know, what I was going to have for dinner, where I should go to university, like just all of these things, interactions with friends and all of this, this worry, this self-doubt, it followed me into university and it reached the point where I was so overwhelmed. The pressure was really getting to me and I started having panic attacks. And I remember the first panic attack I ever had, I was at a crowded party in university and my palms got sweaty. My heart started to beat fast. My vision tunneled. I felt this overwhelming sense of dread take over. And so I locked myself in the bathroom and I remember just sliding down the wall and waiting for it to pass. And ever since then, I started living in fear of when was the next panic attack going to strike? So I was so overwhelmed and it was getting to be a lot for me to manage. So I went to my doctor and I said, I'm having a lot of anxiety. What can we do? And she pulled out her prescription pad and she started writing me out something for anti-anxiety meds. And I said, well, let's just pause here for a moment because I really haven't explored any of my Mm. habits or like any other lifestyle behaviors. And so this is really where I began my journey to healing, where I started to address the root of what was going on, of why I was feeling anxious and putting habits into place that helped me regulate and stay balanced. So I started with my diet. I added in mood boosting foods and I reduced and removed some that just through my own research, I thought, hey, maybe this is causing anxiety. And I started to feel calmer. And then I still felt like my nervous system was amped up a lot. And so I started practicing yoga. And I felt calmer still. And then I still felt like I had a million different thoughts swirling around, overthinking all the time. And I started practicing meditation. And that was like the last piece of the puzzle for me. And I feel like I really cracked the code on 
what are these pieces that come together that we can put in our, in our life, in our, you know, in our every day, these habits that we can put in place that are going to help us regulate, feel calmer and come back into balance. And so that's what I teach others now. Mm. Well, the fact that you've researched this deeply and implemented all these lifestyle measures in your own life, you know, you are the N of one, they call it in a research study, don't they? So that's powerful medicine that you've, you've got right there. And so sharing it with other people just seems like the next step sensibly. And I know for me, my own experience around anxiety work, I never had it really until around menopause. And it really strangely came to visit me in lots of different times when like, I didn't like driving over a bridge, a high bridge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I stopped liking standing on a high stool or a ladder or, you know, I'd never had anything like this before. And, and sort of fear of crowded situations, not knowing how to sort of tackle entering a room, a busy party type uh, scenario. And yeah, and really nervous on the roads. I mean, I used to be very happy to jump in the car at the drop of a hat and go anywhere. Never had anything like it and lots of other situations as well, but very unfamiliar it was to me and, and, and other things were happening too. So, you know, of course I was getting hot in the night and mm -hmm. the brain fog and, and so many of the other symptoms, but that anxiety piece, that was not something I ever expected or anticipated. And so this can really take the rug out from under us when we're experiencing these things for the first time in middle life or at any time. So what you said about sliding down the wall and then starting to worry about when the next occasion was going to arise, right. you know, and that really can only fuel this situation of worry and anxiety and panic. Yes, it's so true. And this is what anxiety thrives off of is when we experience some sort of situation. So perfect example, you're, you know, you're you used to be fine with bridges. And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, the first time, maybe you start to have that thought of like, oh, this is really high. And so we can get those sort of physiological signals, right? Our heart starts to beat fast. We have rapid thoughts. And then we start to build this association that, oh, that was really uncomfortable to feel those sensations. I don't want to feel them again. And so we can kind of start to work ourselves up then, that then when the bridge, the next bridge comes up, we start to get, you know, that panicky kind of sensation again. And then it just builds up and overflows in our mind. And anxiety really thrives off of that is what I have found with clients is that it's more about the fear of getting anxiety and not being able to handle it. It's almost like we have anxiety about having anxiety, right? Yeah. What if this happens? and I can't handle it. We feel like it's going to be too much and we're just not going to be able to cope. And what I always tell people is that anxiety is very uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous to the body. Mm -hmm. So you will be able to cope with it. It's just as uncomfortable in the moment. That is true, isn't it? Even if we were hyperventilating to the point where you pass out, I suppose the worst thing is you might fall and hurt yourself. But Usually it is harmless, but yeah, try telling your brain that. It's well, yeah, right. Anxiety is not because when we're feeling anxious as well, that rational part of the brain mm -hmm. is gone. It goes out the window, right? You're in fight or flight. Your body thinks it's in a state of true survival. Like something about this situation feels incredibly dangerous. And that could be like a physical danger of, you know, what if I were to drive off this bridge or something? But it can also be this sort of like emotional danger, which I find is more common for people. So, you know, I'm just sending an email. Like, why am I feeling anxious right now? Or I'm just getting a text from a friend that says, hey, can we talk? And it's like immediate anxiety, right? So those are the kind of things that uh, I, I think affect a lot of us. Yeah, yeah. That really resonated with me because the overthinking and the ruminating and going over uh, either things that have happened before or, you know, how you can see a tone of voice in an email or a text and then you suddenly you're down the worry hole. 
with that yes. one. It is very challenging for, for lots of women to deal with this. And, and really, that there's very little in the way of help because it's got to come from us within with guidance from somebody like yourself to sort of guide us down that path of finding this recipe for dealing with anxiety. And you alluded to it earlier in our conversation, the, the pillars, the three pillars of managing anxiety in this holistic fashion. So let's just talk first about the, the food piece, because you know, people wouldn't necessarily put food and anxiety together, would they, in, in a sentence? Yeah, I think it's a really undertapped area that, you know, we make the link in a certain sense of if I am eating a lot of fried foods or if I don't eat a lot of veggies, like, yeah, I kind of feel sluggish maybe, right? Mm-hmm. I don't, my, maybe my tummy hurts. But the power of food and of nutrition and, and of eating these targeted specific nutrients can help anxiety so much. I mean, there's a lot of really compelling research evidence showing that certain nutrients, certain foods have a link to helping us regulate our nervous system, helping make our neurotransmitters, helping balance our gut health. Mm -hmm. All of these things are going to improve anxiety. Yeah, the gut-brain connection really cannot be underestimated, can it? So the the power of that. So there's foods Mm -hmm. that you contain, there's micronutrients that will be so good for us. And then there are other things that we might even be seeking out unwittingly, unknowingly, things that are counterproductive, like caffeine, like alcohol, perhaps. Mm-hmm. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's part yes. of it, you know, isn't it? Well, yeah, right. It's, it's not just what you eat and incorporating these mood-boosting foods, but it's also what are you having in your diet that could, as you say, be counterproductive to anxiety, right? Caffeine comes to mind as a big one. Because it's going to put you in that fight or flight mode. And when you are anxious, you are already in fight or flight. We don't want to be pushing that nervous system pathway anymore. And I always say to people, you know, what are we using caffeine for? Because most people will have it right in the morning when they wake up, right? If you think about it, that should be the time that you should feel the most alert, the most awake. Because we've just presumably had restful sleep. Now, when it comes to menopause, that's not always the case, right? Sleep issues are a big problem and that's going to affect anxiety. So we want to, you know, try to line up that first domino so that we're getting high quality sleep, you know, good sleep hygiene, putting our phone away, um, making sure the temperature in the room is regulated so that we can be more comfortable when we sleep. But then when we wake up in the morning, what about some different caffeine alternatives? So maybe something like a dandelion root tea. That's what I opt for in the morning. Caffeine free, made of actual like what you'd find outside like dandelions and it's kind of multi and earthy but it does give you a bit of stimulation without having that you know that peak and then that drop that comes Mm. along with caffeine we also Mm. have decaf as an option or teas or even mushroom based coffees where we're seeing ingredients like cordyceps mushroom incredible for increasing your cardio capacity but also energizing Ingredients like maca, great for balancing blood sugar. We see these in, in these caffeine-free coffee alternatives. So that could be one for people to consider. And, you know, it doesn't have to be cold turkey. It can be something that you're tapering down on and having just less and less. Maybe at the start, it's that second afternoon coffee that you're targeting and bringing that to a tea instead. And I think we want to talk about sugar too, processed sugar. <laughs> Oh, darn. Do we want to talk about it? (laughs) We should. We should. (laughs) Now, I have a huge sweet tooth, so I totally get it. Any like no amount of sugar is too much sugar in my books in terms of taste. But in terms of nutritionist, Heather, there is, you know, there is a big link there because when we're having processed sugar, so this is like high fructose corn syrup, things that we would find in our cookies and cakes and candies. It's going to spike your blood sugar which is when we don't have stable blood sugar, that's going to affect anxiety. And it also uses up your body's resources to process Mm. it. It's non-nutritive, meaning it's the processed sugar is not giving you anything. And so it's going to affect gut bacteria. And we know people who have high sugar, high processed sugar diets have less gut bacteria and less variety of gut bacteria. So lots of alternatives instead. We have maple syrup, honey, agave. These aren't going to spike blood sugar as much, and they're going to come along with some micronutrients that are going to be a bit better uh, for the gut as well. Honey, if you're having honey, go for the 
the real raw honey because that is going to have some bacteria in it. So it's going to be beneficial for the gut and it's antimicrobial. So it's something oh, to consider. Yeah, that's a good tip. So the idea that we nourish the body and I can hear some people sort of rolling their eyes when we talk about dandelion coffee and all these weird and wonderful things, but it's something that I've come to really appreciate in the last few years, all the different flavors. And I never thought I could enjoy those kinds of things, honestly, if given the option that it was never going to be my first choice but in interestingly now I'm you hear me talking about drinking the different kinds of tea and uh, different kinds of day you know different brews will come out and and I love the variety actually that you know you can really have quite a varied and interesting drink routine rather than you know is it tea or coffee or water there's a there's a whole repertoire of, of things we could try oh yeah so you know yeah. yeah don't don't let your preconceptions get in the way try these things we they mm -hmm. can grow on you can't they you know yeah yeah and there's so many alternatives these days and you know i get for a, for a lot of people coffee is like a ritual right it's this mm -hmm. time where we have a nice warm cup in our hands and it's time to ourselves and I want us to still include that in our day, right? But could we swap out what's in the cup? Because then we still have this self-care time, this ritual, this habit for ourselves where we can just pause and enjoy. But then maybe we're swapping out, you know, what's in it and trying these different alternatives. And it really does just involve an openness to explore and try new things. Yeah. And sometimes we get so desperate, we would try anything pretty much. So I think a cup of tea is pretty low down on the threat list. So the other piece, you mentioned yoga. And of course, I'm a certified yoga teacher, so I'm right with you on that one. I absolutely love yoga for the, the effects on the brain as much as the effects on the body. And so this, this was something you discovered for your own self while you were get into grips with your own struggles with anxiety. And it is just amazing stuff, isn't it? Yes. But let me share, because I think a lot of people feel like when they come to yoga, they're going to be, you know, completely calm and it's going to be this serene atmosphere. And that wasn't my experience. I came from a background of boot camps and circuit training classes and high intensity workouts. And so to come into a class that forced me to slow down, that forced me to connect with my body and with my breath, that felt very uncomfortable. And so the first couple times that I did yoga, I did not enjoy it. The first class I went to was actually a mistake. I thought I was going to a circuit training class and I ended up at a yoga class. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just stay and see what happens. And I left that class going, that was so slow. Like, what was that? I don't feel like I got a workout at all. And I really had to change my mindset around what was mm -hmm. yoga going to offer me. But I did keep going back. And what I found is that the more I went back, I started to find this greater connection to how my body moved and moving more into a state of appreciation for my body. I think the lens I was coming with before was using exercise as punishment. It was like, I ate this cookie. I have to burn off these calories. It was a really unhealthy relationship, both with food and with exercise. And so yoga offered something different. It was a way to move that felt really supportive to the body. And it wasn't about punishment. And I noticed that afterwards, my breath regulated as well. So I was used to taking these sort of short, anxious kind of breaths. And even throughout the day, I would find that I was holding my breath, just full of tension throughout my day. And when I would leave a yoga class, I felt like, everything was just more expansive, more clear. And I would have, you know, these bouts of creativity after uh, a yoga practice. And I started to understand that when I was practicing, it was switching my nervous system over into that rest and digest, that parasympathetic side, right? And that's where creativity, where growth, where happiness, where connection, that's where all of those kinds of qualities hang out. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting because you, you may not have been aware of the way that you were breathing before trying or, or engaging with yoga. And then gradually, probably over time, the penny starts to drop. And as you become more in tune with your, your own physicality, 
Yeah, and that and that can be really hard because uh, anxious people, you know, to to sort of say, oh, just take a deep breath, and they're already over breathing. You know, it's it's not helpful always to talk about breathing with people who are anxious. But for you to come to that sort of appreciation, I suppose, is what happened, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And it um, took and it took years to get there, I think, as well, because I was a perfectionist. And so I expected, you know, the first time I was going to try something, I was going to be good at it. I was going to be as good as the teacher right away. That was my expectation. And so I had so much pressure on myself around having to perform in a class. And that's been a real retraining is to do something just for the joy of it, not for needing to master something or for it to look or feel a certain way, but to just notice, oh, you know what? This feels really good for the body. I'm going to continue doing it. It doesn't matter what expression of the pose I'm doing. Well, yeah. And I think, I think of all the things I've ever done, yoga, you have permission in yoga to do that, don't you? You know, it, it, the majority of of teachers will give you permission to do the pose in the way that your speaks to you and your own individual circumstances. So it really is a a time of exploration and of getting to, to know and connect with the body. And so when we feel so out of control, you know, with anxiety, taking us down this rabbit hole of, of spiraling thoughts and such like, then Yoga really can be the antidote to that. Getting into your body can really be the antidote to that. So the other piece, meditation, uh, and that is, you know, in the yoga family, isn't it? Did you, is that how you became aware of, of meditation, the power of meditation? I think I started, you know, being exposed a little bit to it in yoga because yoga came first for me. And really just like at the end, that little Shavasana piece. And just like my journey with yoga at the start, I was like, this is boring. Like you want me to sit there. And I thought, you know, I was supposed to have zero thoughts and just empty my mind. And I was like, I'm an overthinker. How would I empty my mind of thoughts? This, you know, this just isn't for me. And it took a lot of incredible guided experts to help me understand what meditation is. And the fact that it's not about clearing your mind, I think the greatest benefit that I've seen in terms of anxiety when it comes to meditation is that it's helped me learn how to tolerate and sit with discomfort instead of numbing out or running away from it. So then in that way, I can sort of show up and see, oh, I'm having a feeling of anxiety right now and find that separation from it. I am not just an anxious person. I am not my anxiety day. Anxiety is a feeling that I experience. And could I sort of meet that where it is and get curious a little bit about it, right? Usually we bring judgment into the mix, but I find meditation is about getting curious. Like, what do I, what do I notice right now? What sensations do I feel? What could have brought this on, right? What feels unsafe about this situation right now? And can I just allow that to be? Because when you allow it to be, you can allow it to move through a lot easier because no emotion is forever. It sometimes feels like it is when we're in the thick of it, but we're just learning with meditation to kind of ride the wave of it, right? It's going to go by, but let's not grip on and identify so closely with it. We can notice the sensations and then just let it move past. Yes. Meditation is, is difficult, you know, for a lot of people and me included. (laughs) <laughs> to really find the time, you know, to, to it, you, you're looking through your to-do list of all the things that you've got to really get through in a day. Meditating, it, it kind of gets low down on the list and then it falls off completely and it doesn't happen. But the power when we do engage with regular, even a brief meditation, I suppose. So what sort of time would you say you could get the a benefit from? A brief time, a long time, what are we talking? Sure, let's dive into that piece. I I do want to say as well that I like to offer sort of a mindset reframe for some of these uh, meditation pieces is that a lot of times we say like, I don't have the time, right? That's probably the biggest barrier for most people is I don't have the time to meditate. But I see it as something that helps the rest of our day go smoother, right? There's this quote, I think it's by Abraham Lincoln, but He says, if you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe. 
That's what I feel like meditation is. We know from brain studies that it increases our focus, right? It increases our ability to be present, to get to the task at hand. So if we do prioritize spending, and it really can be just a couple minutes a day of guided meditation, because most of us don't have huge blocks of time to spare, right? But I think we can all find or make the time for like a five-minute meditation. And there's even a technique that I teach. I'll share it here with our listeners. It's called the pause three. And it takes less than a minute to do. So the pause three is ideal for between those, you know, those transitions in your day. So if you are waking up in the morning and you start to feel the sense of overwhelm about your to-do list, that's a time for a pause three. If you're in between meetings or on the go, that's a time for a pause three. You want to cap off your day at the end. It's a pause three. And all it involves is taking three deep belly breaths. So you breathe in through the nose, into the belly, and then you breathe out the mouth. And you do three of those in a row. And you could even, if you want to take your hand and place it on your belly and get that bit of feedback that you're indeed uh, breathing into the belly. Because what we know is that type of breath regulates the nervous system and helps switch you over to your parasympathetic side. So I know we all have time for that technique in the day. And if you were to do those in times of transitions and then also maybe add in a two minute morning meditation that gives you affirmations or a five minute meditation check in when you feel anxiety start to rise, those are your tools that will help you regulate and feel more grounded and centered. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for that. I like that because there is invariably just a sort of highway to us when you're shifting from task to task, you know, trying to look for the keys to leave the house, things like this. So you're going to have a moment to fit that in. And you know what you said about sharpening the X, you know, getting yourself set for the day, it can really contribute to doing that. And the effect on our physiology is just phenomenal. The overall management of our stress hormones is really impacted by doing those kinds of uh, th this practice. And stress hormones have got so much to answer for, haven't they, in our physiology? They make us hang on to fat. They stop us from sleeping well. Uh, you know, there's so many reasons why uh, getting on top of that physiology should be at the top of our to-do list, really, not the bottom. Right, exactly, right. And, you know, a lot of this comes down to, I think, these patterns that so many of us have of these sort of like self-sabotage patterns, right? Because a lot of this anxiety work comes from deeper beliefs we have about ourselves, right? If I believe that I'm not good enough, then every time that friend texts me and says, hey, can we talk? I'm going to have a reaction of anxiety because, oh my God, that could feel really scary. So this is sort of like that, you know, that piece that needs to come together with the habits. And I think when we do these habits, right, when we consistently show up for ourselves through a short meditation practice, through moving our body in a way that feels supportive and regulating, through eating mood boosting foods, that really sends the signal to ourselves that I am worth it. I am deserving of this time for myself, right? And that then changes the beliefs that we have deeper inside of ourselves. Yeah, it's powerful stuff. There's no doubt about it. And if you do it, it works is the other thing that I often say to people. Now, we've been having a rehashing of our menopause guidelines in the United Kingdom. And they've come under some criticism because there's been mention of cognitive behavioral therapy as a treatment approach, as a way of supporting women in symptom management. And there's a backlash that it's our estrogen levels that are plummeting and we need to address the estrogen levels with hormone replacement therapy. Now, I am absolutely not categorically against hormone replacement therapy because I have it myself. I've experienced the benefits of, of having hormone replacements at that time of life when I'm, you know, over 50. So I'm not in any way against hormone therapy. However, I do feel that a holistic approach can only support us even further as we make this transition. And so these therapeutic approaches that include 
nourishment to the body with food and movement and the mind, nourishing the mind with the way that we think, the thoughts that we think and the practices. This really is going to boost the effects of that estrogen replacement therapy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, all of this is very supportive to help balance out the body, right? And, you know, we can benefit from these habits at any stage of life. But I think especially when we're going through a transition like menopause, we really need to be cognizant of what do I have in my routine that's supportive? What am I doing every day to help balance out my hormones, right? Boosting estrogen and lowering cortisol because cortisol will start to spike as estrogen lowers. So there is this relationship that we want to be able to tackle and I think better know how we can come back into state of regulation, right? Because it's unrealistic to expect that we would have zero stressors in our life, right? The world is full of stress and our our lives are full of, of stress. But it's about, can I notice when I've started to slip out of that regulated state, maybe my clue is, oh, my heart is starting to beat fast or the overthinking and spiraling is starting to happen. And what are my tools then? to come back into that balanced state. I think knowing, you know, what you can pull from in your toolbox, that's going to be very helpful in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. So I know you've got three pillars and we've talked about food and yoga movement practices and meditation practices. Do you have any other pearls of wisdom stuffed up your sleeve there, Heather? Oh gosh, what wisdom do I have? You know what? I think what I've learned on this lengthy anxiety journey of mine is that anxiety does not have to be a life sentence, that there are so many things that we can do to bring healing into our lives. And it really is about focusing on the habits that we do every day and being consistent with them because you've got to do the things to see the changes, right? We can't just know that something is the matter, but not take that responsibility, that action in our lives. And a lot of people will, will get to the point where they feel like, oh, it's just always going to be this way. You know, I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. And I really think it is about these small, consistent changes that we can put into our day that lead to big changes overall. Yeah, no, absolutely. Start small and keep it sustainable. And I suppose journaling is something that can really help people with this journey of of self-discovery because, I mean, if you're anything like me, you forget all the time what's happened. So keeping a journal, do you encourage people to to keep notes of what what they're doing? Oh, sure. I think journaling can be a helpful practice. I mean, the, the pillars that we've talked about today, the one that meditation falls under, the more broad umbrella term is mindset. I think mindset encompasses these journaling practices. In fact, there's a a program that I run on my app, Cultivating Calm, that is a 14-day journal through anxiety course. And I like to approach it as doing a bit of the shadow work. So in that course, for example, we dive deeper into like, what are the sensations you feel when you're anxious? What are the thoughts that are running through your brain? Can we start to untangle those a little bit and then really get clear on like, why is this anxiety coming up for you? right? Is it this physiological imbalance that you're having in the body? Or are these sort of like deeper patterns, things that are being activated or triggered? Because when we can understand the anxiety better, then I think we can understand how to proceed forward, right? What can we do to to actually help? So I think it's a very helpful tool. uh, And sort of related to that would be practicing gratitude with a journal, right? We know that practicing gratitude can boost mood, reduce anxiety, can reduce physical aches and pains. So even just writing out three things a day that you're grateful for, that can really help, I think, reframe how your day is going and really look for some of those silver linings that are definitely there. Yeah, it takes you out of your own head and, you know, makes us just think a bit outside the box. Well, you mentioned your app there, Heather. Tell me more about this. Happy to share about it. So I launched Cultivating Calm because I feel like what was missing in the anxiety world was clearly laid out practices that you can do holistically and naturally. So on the app, there's meditations, there's yoga classes, there's uh, delicious mood boosting recipes, all plant based. And I think that the another piece that was missing in the anxiety world is a sense of community. 
So I felt really alone and isolated when I was along this anxiety journey. And I felt like I didn't know what pieces to put in place. I was like throwing spaghetti at a wall and seeing what stuck. And I wish that I had, you know, a more supportive team around me. So I wanted to create this space, this community where we're all working together towards a common goal, right? Your practices that you do every day might look a little different, but we're all there with the goal of working on ourselves, improving ourselves, leading you know, more calm, confident, more free lives. So there is this kind of community vibe on the app. And there are programs on the app as well, like the Journal Through Anxiety program that I mentioned. So I did want it to, you know, be supportive and offer something for people that they can do in just a couple of minutes a day. Because as we said, people don't have endless amounts of time for self-care. So it's really about prioritizing yourself for just a few minutes each day and bringing in these holistic pieces of the puzzle, these holistic practices to really see results and have that transformation. Yeah, well, I'm very impressed, I must say. And I think you're right. The craziness that was going on in my head, I definitely felt quite alone with it. And and sometimes that's just because you don't like to say anything. You think, oh, this is a bit odd. And but there's no doubt that a problem shared is a problem heard. And, you know, and, and really speaking out about the, the fact that we are, we are really not on our own in feeling these feelings, in thinking these thoughts, you know, and that sometimes can be the thing that stops people from seeking help, you know, feeling like there's some kind of crazy. So we don't want that for women, for anybody, you know, to have a community, supportive community to call upon for, you know, just to back things around with. That can mm -hmm. only, only ever be a good thing, can't it? Yeah, right. I mean, to cheer people on, I think especially as women, there is something so supportive about these types of networks, right, of coming together. I think as women, we're meant to be in community mm -hmm. like this and have these opportunities to share. And even the other day, one of my members was posting in the community about one um, thing she was struggling with was setting boundaries and saying no to people. And she said, you know, I've just, I just want to be done with this. And another person commented and said, me too, I totally get it. And she shared with me that she felt so validated just by having someone say, like, you know, I get it too. I, I'm doing this too. Here's what's helped for me. And being able to just share, I, mm. I think is really powerful. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming along and sharing your inspiration, your story and your solution. It sounds like you're so together, Heather. Honestly, I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm human just like anybody else. And, you know, I have those days as well. And I really do practice what I preach. I mean, I think the main reason that where I've gotten to where I am and I'm able to take risks and, you know, show up in my life is that I continue to practice these pieces of the puzzle and put them into place. So if anyone does want to check out Cultivating Calm, there's a free trial. You can head to the App Store or Google Play and, and type in Cultivating Calm and check out a free 14-day trial. Yeah, fabulous. Well, get on with this is what I would say. That's so awesome. And, and you know, what you said then, absolutely, I concur. It's really important that we can be there for one another. Well, congratulations. It sounds like it's going to be a raging success. So thank you again so much for giving your time and coming and having a chat with me today. So if you want more of these conversations, remember to share it with your friends because the more people that we can reach and touch with this information, the better. And so thank you so much, Heather. I'll say cheerio and goodbye for now. From Thanks England. for having me, Philippa. <laughs> <laughs> You're so welcome. Thank you so much. Bye.